all for coming. Um, hello, we're delighted that you've come to this book launch. Um, and I'm going to explain how it works in a minute. But first of all, I just want to say welcome to you all. And um, this is the first event we've attempted to hold up here. And we were expecting about four of you. <laughs> Look what happened. There we go. There's plenty of seats at the front and here and here. So do come on up when you've got your drinks. Um, we'll project over your heads, so don't be scared. You can come and sit in the comfy chairs if you get tired. Um, thank you all for coming, first of all. And especially thank you to the musicians that are here that are going to entertain us a little bit later in the band. But also thank you to the pub for hosting this event. We're absolutely delighted. They've been so accommodating. They let us in earlier today. So um, just many thanks to all those people. And of course, to Anna, my great um, compatriot, we planned this months and months ago when we were in the thick of sort of finishing the writing. And we actually met downstairs once um, to just sort of work out what we're going to do. And this is what we're going to do. Um, first of all, I'm going to say a few words about Anna's excellent book. And then Anna's going to say a few things about my excellent second book. great volume. <laughs> and then um, we will open up to any questions. I've got some ready in case you can't think of anything. Um, and after that, we'll have just a little break of about 15 minutes. The bar at the back will be open. Do help yourselves. So we'll go up there and, uh, and buy things. There we go. Um, and after about 10 or 15 minutes, there's a soundtrack that's going on that links to the research that Anna's done in her work. It's worth listening to that, and all will become clear, hopefully. And then the band are going to play four numbers, and then we're going to clear up eventually and go home. That's the plan. Right, should we get on with it? It's going to take a bit of time. Okay. Um, does anyone want to come and have the grand seats up the front? I can see some of you standing in the back who would love to come and have these comfy seats. There's one in the middle there, there's one there, if you wish to, yeah, just, just step up, and if you want to shake your legs, do that. Okay, so, um, so I'm here to tell you about Anna's really excellent book, which is called Class Control and Classical Music. It's available over there, and there's a discount code you can take away and get a copy later if it sounds interesting to you. But I want to set the scene for that, and I hope you'll forgive me for this, but I'm going to tell you a little story about my own early experience of classical music. When I was a boy... I was somewhat reluctant to sing in a youth choir that met on Saturday mornings in the local town. Um, like most young people, I was, for the most part, a seemingly uncontrollable bag of energy that wanted to tear the place apart and cause chaos everywhere I went. So I didn't much like the regimented experience of rehearsals in the rehearsal room. I remember one rehearsal in which I was especially restless and bored of the stipulation to sing the precise prescribed melody accurately. So I improvised my own harmony line above the choir and gyrated my hips like Elvis, <laughs> only to receive the wrath of our choir director, this mistress known as Mrs. Bainbridge. He knows who she is. She demanded that I leave the room if I couldn't do it right. Okay, so this little anecdote about putting down my unruly behaviour in a youth choir setting demonstrates something of the project of Anna's book. In short, it's about explaining how the practices of classical music training are about discipline, disciplining minds and bodies of participants to achieve the right musical results, but in such a way as to get them to conform to dominant white middle-class ideals. I've learned from Anna's book but when I was told to conform or leave, I was in effect being told that my unruly voice and body uh, was not fit for middle class ideals that choral practice represented. As I couldn't escape my middle class background, I was dragged into line to sing whatever dull folk song arrangement by Vaughan Williams we were preparing for the end of term concert. Although, on another memorable occasion, I did fill Mrs. Bainbridge's piano with pencils. <laughs> it turns out that in Anna's fictitious county of Wichchestershire, she's had to be anonymous, you see, so she's invented this place called Wichchestershire, there's a lot of young people that have similar sorts of experiences, albeit in a rather less confrontational rehearsal environment. Her book is based on an anonymised ethnographic study of two youth orchestras, a youth choir and a youth opera company in the south of England, that in the pursuit of the harmonious precision required in classical music, are unknowingly reinforcing the dominant uh, attributes of white middle class society that have been considered desirable since Victorian times. As Anna shows, in one sense, 
This has an important function in helping middle class kids feel a sense of belonging and self-confidence. But in another, it's highly exclusionary of other practices and identities. And as Anna demonstrates, it contributes to social division and inequality between classes. Elvis must leave the building, <laughs> or at least the choir practice. It's not just how the works in the rehearsal room, um, it's not just how that works in the rehearsal room that Anna addresses, but also how it becomes manifest in the music itself, those cherished masterworks of classical music. Note the gendered term, masterworks, which underlines that classical music doesn't just reinforce class differences, but also highly gendered and sexist ideologies. Anna devotes no less than two chapters of her book to consider how power is aligned with a dominating masculinity in the rehearsal room. Male conductors and composers are positioned as active and leading elite, while the mass of performers are positioned in a feminised, passive and receptive position. In this way, Anna argues, people learn their place and expected behaviours within the highly gendered hierarchy of an idealised white middle class society. This is challenging reading for a male conductor like me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's high time we reflected on the effects of rehearsal power structure rather than just perpetuate them. And that's what Anna's book challenges us to do. Anna's book is undoubtedly an important and provocative one. It's, we've been arguing about it all day, me and my colleague Colin, in a good way. It is the first book to consider classical music relative to the operation of the British class system in this way, and it's an investigation of the invisible power structures that's, mu that's long overdue. The institutions of classical music have not much changed in a couple of centuries, and as Anna documents, despite numerous attempts in recent decades to improve access, classical music still remains an overwhelmingly white and middle class culture. Here I am. <laughs> Anna's book helps explain why that is the case. And it argues how more tangible and lasting change might be achieved by focusing on and challenging the practices and structures that perpetuate an exclusionary <coughs> culture. That is rather different to merely addressing access, which effectively allows such exclusionary institutions to continue unchallenged. In an even more radical move, Anna even suggests that the music itself needs to be adjusted if a more egalitarian and less classed racialized and gendered culture is to be achieved. Perhaps masterworks need to become rasterworks, or better still, just music. In my own book, I've tried to uncover how we can hear some of the subtle practices of resistance to institutionalized racism that were recorded by a black band on some dusty old discs long ago. Anna's book, on the other hand, deals very much with the present moment and suggests that if we want greater social inclusivity through music making, we must listen out for the devices of classical music that are divisive and challenge them. In effect, she argues that classical music must not be allowed to continue to pretend to be an art that rises above social politics when it's actually all about them in maintaining a white middle class defined status. Quote, she makes this argument with great conviction, based on a great deal of data that she's collected, that's addressed using an oppressive range of intersecting methodologies, drawn from a range of disciplines before, beyond her own sociological and musical training. In all respects, the book marks a great achievement. Well, bloody done. <laughs> and it taught me a great deal about things I had always suspected were going on in classical music, but was never quite sure where or how. It's also made me feel a bit better about messing about in rehearsals. Because I know now that in my own feeble way, I was just trying to stand up to the articulation of white middle class power, even if I didn't know it at the time. Um, you might not agree with everything Anna says in her book. And I hope you won't, because that's part of its point. It's about challenging those things, not just going along with the status quo. But I recommend her book to you in the highest possible terms as a provocative and much needed assessment of classical music learning culture. I think it's excellent and well worth the cover price. There you go. Thank you, Anna, for letting me share it. You know what? It seemed like such a idea, good idea to share this at the time, but now I'm terrified that I've misrepresented that in some way, and I know she feels the same about me, but it's okay. It's okay. Whatever you say is the truth. <laughs> Go. 
Thank you so much, George. You have not misrepresented oh, well, my book. And in fact, I think coming from a white middle class conductor who, I, who, who does get a massive kicking in my book, I mean, not you personally, but <laughs> the, the, you know, that group of people. And so it was very brave of you not only to read it, but also to, um, you know, to kind of recommend it. So I should say that our books, there's a book table there, and um, you can, uh, George's book is a much more reasonable um, cover price, um, but mine, you can take a discount voucher, or you can buy one with a discount voucher today, but it'll be in the library, so, so don't worry too much about that. It's amazing to see so many people here, and it's really nice to have a book launch with some music. Sociologists, we, we tend to talk about music, and we never actually have any music, so um, a particular thanks to the band for coming along, and, and it's been fantastic co-organising with George. Um, I think I suspect we're going to have a lot of arguments about my book, <laughs> about my book coming up, and I would, and I don't know if I agree with everything I said, so I would encourage you to to um, to disagree with me as well. So it was a huge pleasure to read George's book, partly because I had to listen to music all the way through. It wasn't some dry sociological text, but I had to kind of put on the soundtrack of the uh, jazz songs that he was writing about all the way through, all the way through. And, he, and the songs have got, have got titles like Froggy Bottom, so um, there was plenty of kind of, um, plenty, plenty to get my teeth into there. Um, so this book focuses, yeah. <laughs> I'm intentionally, <laughs> okay, moving swiftly on. <laughs> um, so this book focuses on Andy Kirk and his jazz band in the 1920s and 1950s in the US. And of course at the time the US was heavily segregated by race. And so as a black jazz band and jazz band leader, these musicians were were, had to negotiate the race politics of their time. And in particular, George plays out how, um, looks at how this played out in the music itself, pun intended. Um, so Andy Kirk grew up in Denver, Colorado, and this was a less segregated area uh, than other parts of the US. Um, so, but he became a musician because there were fewer opportunities for employment for black men, and because it was a it was a heavily white um, um, entertainment scene he played for, he ended up playing music for white people, white venues. Now this is significant because not only was the country divided, but also the music was perceived was divided or perceived as being divided. And it effectively segregated into two distinct genres. And this is where we're going to need the musicians in a, in a bit. There was hot jazz, which you might know of um, if you've played, um, if you've heard or played Lindy Hop. It's that kind of much faster paced kind of um, um, with lots of improvisation. And then, but then sweet jazz was the genre associated with white musicians or with white um, uh, with, with, with white people. And, and so for sweet jazz, think crooners, think slower tempo, think melodies. So on a very basic level, and I apologise if I'm doing violence to your argument. Um, the hot jazz was associated with black musicians and white jazz, uh, sweet jazz seen, seen as a form of white music. But here's a problem for Andy Kirk's band. He's a black musician with a black jazz band playing for predominantly white audiences. So this starts getting complicated when you bring the recording industry into it. If you're playing live, the, the, the dancers and the audience could see that they were black. But on a recording, they, had to, they were forced by the producers to, to black up, to mask up their music and to sound more black. Um, and so um, this wasn't necessarily how, how they normally played these numbers, but this was how the kind of segregated uh, recording industry forced them to change their, their music. And this is where I think George's analysis starts to get even more interesting. He draws on this idea of signifying, which is a theory some of you might be familiar with, developed by Henry Louis Gates Jr. And this is about how African Americans' people's use of language is shaped by a history of slavery and oppression. Um, so it's using language as kind of verbal play to confound the expected or literal meanings and to communicate under oppression. So George describes it as basically saying one thing but meaning another. And under slavery, this was a necessary way of communicating. And then after slavery, during segregation, this mode of communication continued. And so George takes this idea and applies it to musical communication in this jazz scene. So he shows how Kirk's band play with the stylistic expectations of a, of a, of a black band. So the expectation was they're playing a hot jazz style, but, but they were playing a lot, they were playing both genres, they were playing everything. Um, 
So signifying in music in this way, play, taking a white, uh, a kind of a white sweet jazz number and putting some elements of hot jazz or, or, or kind of more black version of jazz into it, allow these musicians to function within racist cultures of performing and recording. So for example, maybe using, using falsetto in a way that wouldn't have been expected at the time. But, the, but for people in the know, um, listening to it would connect to, um, would connect to southwestern blues music or would signify falseness or in inauthenticity, introducing a critical or subversive note into what might be a straight sounding love song. So in this book, in this way, George um, shows how the music itself always functions within and in dialogue with the social context it's being produced in. And I think this is really helpful for me and for other sociologists. So we can, I mean, we can learn a lot from reading this because sociologists have been talking about this idea of of what we call the social aesthetic in music. So the idea that you don't just look at the inequalities or who's playing the music or social relations around the music, you have to look at the music or the cultural object itself. I mean, for sociologists, this is big news. Oh my God, we actually have to look at <laughs> the culture itself. And I think for, um, for uh, George's book provides a masterclass in how we can bring the music itself into our analysis. So I want to highlight just a couple of points of dialogue between my book and, um, and George's. And um, I, some of the stuff I found fascinating was the pedagogic and rehearsal practices that he describes that Kirk's band have. Um, so as a boy growing up in Denver, so Andy Kirk came from a middle class black family in Denver, um, he, said, he took piano lessons, but he actually gave them up because it was too girly, basically. And that's interesting because I've argued in my book that, uh, that learning classical music is, uh, particularly piano, is historically feminized as a form of respectability or a way of being kind of a nice girl. And so it's interesting that that's exactly what Andy Kirk experiences. So then he takes lessons in saxophone and in musical arranging from members of the Denver Symphony Orchestra, and I'm assuming they were white. Uh, yeah, seems about right. Um, so he's having this formal tuition, but then alongside that, he's actually doing you know the thing that a lot of jazz musicians uh, do and still hear um, brass band musicians learning on the job. So he sits in the band with an instrument until he figures out how to play it. And there's a funny story about how he gets booked as a young man to sit on the stage with a saxophone, but not play it because he didn't know how to play it, just because it was cool to have a saxophone player on stage in your band. <laughs> So there's a combination of formal and informal pedagogy or learning music. And in, the, in my book, I've obviously talked about the very formalized modes of uh, learning classical music as part of the boundary drawing, which keep it middle class. And so uh, this, this book gives a, gives a contrasting way of learning music across notation and um, across, um, across not working with notation. So he talks about how some bands would work with riffs, so short musical phrases that you just build up together and you can create more complex structures. So some musicians were working with riffs and improvisation, others were working with notated music, and many were working across notated and non-notated music. So, um, and this allowed, and the improvisation obviously allowed for the kind of um, brilliant musicians, um, such as pianist and composer Mary Lou Williams, who were in Andy Kirk's band to show off their skills. So there's, there's these different modes of rehearsal and pedagogy um, that work across um, that work across different um, uh, different hot jazz and sweet jazz, and I think it's really interesting to think about how that might form the basis for shaking up the pedagogy and rehearsal practices, and of course the music itself within classical music. Um, and I think one of the most vivid sections of the book for me, well, I mean there were many many vivid sections. Um, was evident in the description of Kansas City uh, in the 1930s. So um, he des uh, George describes how in Kansas City, which was known as the play Paris of the Plains, and it was it was a depression area. Um, it was very isolated from everywhere else, and there was this incredible music scene. There were um, late night bars open all over the shop, and all of them had their own bands. And then after hours, the musicians would stay and jam late into the night. And so it developed, Kansas City developed its own distinctive sound. And after hours, musicians would show off and exchange ideas amid, with contests of, of virtual uh, musicianship. And I think I can detect that you kind of, kind of wanted to be in Kansas in the 1930s, maybe, <laughs> which I certainly did read it. <coughs> but I think what's really interesting here is that he draws out the ways in which Andy Kirk's band learned, developed his musical style um, and, and, he thinks, and for sociologists, it's interesting to think about the role of musical scenes in developing genres and styles of playing and in developing musical talent or ability. 
So there's a huge amount more I could highlight. And I think, um, I mean, it was, it was an incredibly enjoyable book to read for a start, but I think there's a, a huge sophistication in the way that the music itself is linked into the social analysis. So we have got use of social theory and use of musical theory in a way that is actually, it doesn't seem difficult when you read it, but I know from experience it's incredibly difficult to do that really well. And um, there's a huge amount more that I would love to highlight, um, for example, how the dancers, how the musical style was influenced by the dancers um, and the way the dancers moved. But overall, I think this book provides, um, it captures how a musical analysis can provide a lens into some of the complexities of making culture within a racially segregated country. And so I salute George for writing an absolutely brilliant analysis of this. And I urge you to have a read. say something about the music we're going to play in a minute first, but you might be just thinking if you've got any questions you'd like to ask Anna or I while I do this. The band are going to play four numbers, and they're, they're, they're chosen partly because I, I had the time to transcribe some of the music and collect the music more than there's any kind of really intelligent scheme, but it turns out it might work quite well. The first number we're going to play and um, is called Snag It, and it's a number from the earlier 1920s that was made famous by the band Louis Armstrong was in. Um, uh, and it's in a 12-bar blues, so almost the blackest style, if you like, to be a little bit stereotyped about it. It's a stomping style, um, and it's the only piece we're going to play that's in that style. And what that illustrates is the very first recordings that were made by Andy Kirk's band were this style of music, because they were recording on a race label, as it was called, a label that was aimed at what white producers thought a black audience wanted. So this is an example of that style. Then we're going to go on and play two numbers that are a more um, kind of upbeat and dancey, which is the kind of thing they play for white audiences, upbeat dancing for white audiences rather than the really sweet style. Um, the first one's called I Lost My Gal in Memphis, and the second one is the theme tune to a film that came out which was called Loose Ankles, all about flapping in the 20s. <laughs> and the final one, in Kirk's band, Anna mentioned there was this brilliant pianist composer called Mary Lou Williams, and she composed a lot of the early music. And what she tried to do was to marry the black style with the kind of white sweet style they were doing. And the piece is called Mary's Idea. And it is that. It's an attempt to try and put these two ideas together, if you like. And we were, I was talking to a couple of members of the band about this piece. And they said she perhaps tries to do a bit too much. But that makes it a lovely challenge for us to play. It's rather wonderful. So they're the four pieces you're going to hear. Right, enough of that. Um, any questions? Would you like to ask any questions of Anna or I? You can come and talk to us afterwards if you don't want to do it in this public forum. Now's your chance. Mike. One for you, George. I was, we all introduced us on George's uh, oeuvre. I was very taken with this idea of the musicians after their work, they would stay behind and uh, and they get together and do what they wanted. I had exactly that experience. A friend of mine and I ran a jazz club in the, in the Newport Valleys in the 50s, and we didn't start until the dance halls were around about closed. Yeah. And then they would all come and do what they wanted, and it was the most wonderful, liberating experience. It was very dull until about 12 o'clock at night, but then after that, it really livened up. And I was just so interested that I had some of that experience. I think that the, the difference between classical music and jazz is that to some extent, that the regimented idea of going to a rehearsal at you know, 10 o'clock in the morning for a concert that evening is turned on its head. You do the gig first, and then you stay there, and then there's talk of people just staying up the whole next day and carrying on the jam session of one sort or another, and it was much less formalised. And it was liberating, I think, and I think there's a lot of talk of the mixing and just having this wonderfully social encounter with music, which is maybe something we've lost sometimes. I mean, we met as a band on Sunday for the first time. We've had one rehearsal, by the way, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, but the, the trouble with that is that we only, we only really got to know each other sort of briefly. And afterwards, some of us came for a drink and we got chatting. But I think if you know each other a little better, you get that sort of sense of kinship of what you're trying to do. I think some of it will come across today, because we do know each other a little bit. But had we played, 
from 12 midnight till 5 the following morning, and especially fueled with certain substances. It might have been quite a different experience. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Um, as I'm allowed to, I'm going to ask Anna a question or two. Um, the first question I want to know is, um, why has no one really done this before? Why has no one really challenged the kind of middle class thing that's going on in classical music? That's a really good question. Yeah, I maybe want to hear that myself now. So, um, what I have said is my background is also as a musician, sorted. Um, so, I also had that kind of very disciplined youth choir, youth orchestra experience. I grew up, as you can probably tell, I grew up, grew up in New Zealand. So, what am I doing talking about the British class system when I'm from New Zealand? Um, my grandmother was English and emigrated to New Zealand and brought with her her ideas about nice girls wear skirts and learn to play the piano which I did very successfully. Um, and so my background as a musician um, um, led to me studying music when I left school and continuing um, to study over here at the Royal Scottish Conservatoire and working as a freelance musician for a few years. But I left and I became a sociologist thinking I am not going to write about music. And I think I did that, what you might call, what sociologists would call identity work of taking my affiliation, my identity of classical musician and taking and getting rid of it basically. And being like, no, I'm moving on, I'm, I'm, I'm done with this, I'm going to move on and do something different. And I think for classical, you, for classical musicians, it's, as you know, many of you will know, it's such a strong identity, it's such an important part of who you are. And that's part of its power, and that's, what's, you know, that's part of what's fantastic. But to actually write critically about it, you can't also be holding that identity as an important part of yourself. So I had to step away, have a few years to distance myself in order to kind of, what we would call as in sociology, make the familiar strange. So I had to kind of make, make what I had, what had been my everyday life, um, strange in order to, or, or unfamiliar in order to, in order to write about it this way. So I think that's why it hasn't been done so much, because you have to both have been in it and then have got out of it. Having said that, there are you know there are a couple of um, um, studies. Um, there's a there's an interesting yeah you know, there are a couple of studies that do that do this, and I am seeing more people starting to starting to work on inequalities and in classical music. All right, so I take what you say, but here's the thing. You know, musical education schools is under a tremendous pressure at the moment, and um, in a way, this criticism that you're offering um, could be seen to further endanger that. Yeah. What would you say to that? Yeah, I Given think, that you yeah. benefited from it personally. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I think that's really, really important. And I guess um, one of the things I would say, yeah, so this book, academic publishing is incredibly slow. I actually finished writing this um, in January last year, and we've seen the evidence about what's happening in schools come out since then. So if I had known that, I would have incorporated that more into my analysis. Um, I think, but I think this is a problem that, you know, the, the left has more generally. We get... You know, should we have internal critique, or should we all band together and, and toe the party line? Um, and, um, and, and, and you know, is there what space is there for internal critique within what we're doing? And I suppose, you know, as a white middle class woman, I have may, mainly overall been privileged by being part of this. But I know that other people have have been excluded from this scene. And so, in a sense, I do feel that it's important that I speak, or that I kind of use my voice as a sociologist to speak on behalf of those who have actually left and, and not felt that it's, it's okay to participate, or who have experienced the kind of bullying or harassment by music teachers or conductors that I write about in the book. I, I think it's important to talk about that dark side, because we're not going to make it better until we actually look at what's going on. Yeah, and I think to be fair, you do talk about some of the subjects you met during your um, investigations and the value they found doing that. Yeah. So it's not all about sort of, this not is a terrible <laughs> thing. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, the huge value and the huge identity, um, sense of identity that people got from playing this music is, is, is crucially important. All right, now I'll shut up in a minute. This is the last thing. Um, <laughs> okay. So Anna has prepared a playlist, and oh, I thought yeah. it might be quite nice. Um, we're going to have that playlist on. It, the speakers aren't terribly loud, so you might need to come up this end to hear it a bit. But when we have the 10-minute break in a minute to get the band ready, I'd like you to just listen to that music. Um, because at the end of her book, at the conclusion of her book, she says, if we really want to change the structures, then we have to change the music itself. The music needs to be different. Okay, so what might that music sound like? <laughs> I, 
I, I, yeah, you're, the, you're in music now. I'm in sociology. I just diagnose the problems. Back um, <laughs> So this is your job. No, I think, I mean, I do think that we, uh, the main thing is we need to work more across genres. So um, different genres of music, whether that's classical, um, jazz, um, um, hip hop, are strongly associated with social groups. Um, particularly age and class, but also ethnicity, uh, to a lesser extent gender. And so if we want to kind of, especially in, the, in times when the country, I mean particularly the UK, is so divided at the moment, how do we allow people to come together through music and talk to each other across social divides? We actually need social mixing to take place through music. And classical music, um, despite trying to do that, is not necessarily allowing that to happen, or successfully allowing that to happen. So I think we need to work more across different genres. We need to take the score, we need to, yes, we have to keep playing classical music and working with this amazing music. We have to keep take, we have to take it and mess with it and be much less reverent towards it and work across different genres. Uh, so we get musicians from different genres to talk to each other. So the playlist, uh, we play some music by Susumi Yakota, who's a Japanese composer. And one of the interesting things he does is he samples classical music as an electronic musician. And he does this, I think, in very skillful ways. Um, but a lot of the musicians uh, here might disagree with me. Um, but if you can guess at least um, four of the samples he uses, I'll buy you a drink. Wow, that's an offer. The bar is open. Um, you can come and talk to us. The band need to kind of get ready because they want to hear the music. And uh, we'll kick off in about 10, 15 minutes. Deal? Yeah. Deal, call and response. <laughs> Lovely, thank you very much. Yeah.
Thank <laughs> you. 